And we got to mm -hmm. have to figure out who did it. This um, is what we see what now. And I thought it was fun. Um, to sort of so you're sure that I can't do a uh, speaker's um, view, right? So that's well, we got an ongoing yeah, process, I think. I think. More or less, I think that the, um, there's some level of time pressure to accomplish all of the work because um, one okay. thing that the administration has said is that they can't let the sort of negotiation okay. process go on forever, that. and that more or less, if, if we don't have sort of solid interdepartmental agreements that the overall trend will be that where in the absence of an agreement between departments that the fall between the medicine department um, as far as the responsibility for admitting. Um, and I think that um, as this is going on, we've seen sort of an increased trend um, for other departments kind of deflecting when um, they're asked to admit to the patient. Um, I know that one of the and I wanted to sort of bring this forward in case people had positive feedback about it. Um, but it seems to have been sort of under the radar unilateral transfer of responsibilities uh, for admissions of a primarily neurological working diagnosis um, to the to the medicine doctors without enough, I think, dialogue or consent about it. Um, and um, what's been happening is often when we do refer the case to neurology. Most of the neurologists right now are telling the ED that they no longer admit patients. Um, and the ED is then reassigning the standard admissions to medicine on that advice, uh, even though they know that it doesn't reflect the legitimate policy settlement between the departments. Um, and so this often puts the medicine doctor in the position of neurologists not having come to see their patients, not giving treatment recommendations. Um, and if the medicine doctor tries to redirect the pending referral, um, often the case has been getting referred out to a separate medicine group, um, just sort of a preemptive question of any um, clinical responsibility uh, for patients. Um, and um, you know, on the back end, when they're seeing patients in consult, I'm finding that the recommendations we're getting are sometimes cursory and sometimes not as friendly as patients in the um, and it's doing up time while we're on the phone here today to redirect um, when you didn't get it a here, plug in for you. Um, and so I don't know, you know, I don't mind doing more than you need to be saying. Um, so I don't mind doing more than you need to be saying. Um, and also to take responsibility that I've been working for the plan for. Um, and also the patient's not getting, um, cared for. Um, so yeah, that's, I, nice. know, that's sort of one, uh, and I would hate for this to be so an accelerated trend um, across multiple service lines, um, because basically yeah, that makes the medicine department sort of the cat herders of the, um, of, of the entire facility. Um, so I, mean, I don't know how much of an issue people think this is. Um, if you do think it's an issue, what kind of an approach should we take to the department? Just, just to give you a feedback, it is, it is, it is an issue for uh, not just the uh, neurology group, but for other groups. And one of the things is when patient yeah. care gets a uh, uh, backseat uh, to convenience of the provider, that is a problem. Um, there are independent uh, uh, practitioners whose patients have been diverted to uh, other medical providers because the when uh, when the uh, the uh, specialists are called and they said well tell medicine to the test and uh, I have had a, a sort of a denigrating experience with one of the, one group of our colleagues who said well it's a quality of life issue for us we're not going to admit I said hello uh, so what are the internists I mean, you know, we know that, you know, we may be on the bottom of the food chain, but I think that's an unacceptable approach to categorize lifestyle as, um, you know, being more important than the patient's proper management. Um, you know, I, um, I think I kind of burned some bridges in that because I was very vocal in advocating for this group's sentiment. The providers have said the patients have come into the ER, the private patients for years and years, and they've been diverted to 
again, uh, important outside because the, the group said, okay, if the regular doctor is not comfortable in taking care of this acute uh, intracranial bleed or this person who is having another issue, uh, just call these other people. They'll admit. And then the patients have been told to follow up with them at their offices. Happened to me, my patients. And I was pretty, pretty uh, belligerent, to say the least, to both with our emergency room as well as with the people who were taking care of it. I think it's, it's really um, unethical, you know, really. It's not, not appropriate, especially with those of us who are here every single day. Uh, that, that happens because it's convenient for somebody so they don't have to put the orders there. So what I have started to do is ask how long is it taking in those cases where a patient comes in with a proximate cause where we need a uh, specialist to get on board and manage the patient. How long it does it take for that specialist to come in? This is, I admit the patient, how long is it taking for that person? to come in and see the patient. And believe you me, in the majority of the cases, it's more than 12 hours. Our standard bylaws, which the new regime is saying, either you follow the bylaw or pull them up. Get rid of the bylaw. And I think it makes total sense because we, we really haven't put, um, you know, our foot down on that. But we're going to be measuring that. Not only that, from the time stamp that the patient is coming into the ED to the time they're getting to the floor and the doctor seeing them, we're going to measure that time. I think we are a medical center. Patients deserve efficient, uh, prompt care. And we're going to need to uphold uh, whatever our bylaws are on that. And if we can, you know, that, that's going to become an issue. Uh, it, 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 it's just not right. If that was any of our family members, I'm sure we wouldn't want uh, them to be sitting around until somebody finally comes because it's convenient for them at that time. And I think that there are decisions that the, the hospital has to make as to what happens to those uh, uh, um, clusters where doctors are saying, you know, it's my lifestyle issue and I'm not going to be able to come in the middle of the night and give orders or what have you. Uh, so I think as far as that part is concerned, so you and I, we have had this discussion, you have had this discussion, the Medigrap's last message was that ED determines who is the person to be called. They're not going to go through 10 different calls to get somebody to come and see the patient. And if whatever their call is, we're going to follow that. When the person gets when you get a call from people, hopefully not to be able to capture anger. And the first thing that you do is that they want to say. Yes. When the person, there's no other issue, there's only a fraction. So where does that, where do you find it? Uh, I, I've been again very, very uh, sensitive to, to that issue, and that's why I said that you know somebody coming in with an intracranial bleed or having a, a acute stroke or what have you. Um, we're again saying that that, that if they determine if, if uh, the person is coming in with with a broken uh, knee or hip or what have you, orthopedics would be called. And what the said, no, they don't they no, I think that was the thinking. I don't believe that is that is any more. I think the other mechanism of correcting that would be to go to the relevant service and say, look, this is a good thing. I'm going to get this part this on my service. Let's come to an agreement of what. A lot of this is generated by, I think, and there is a danger associated with saying people who are lactation, who the admitter is in the absence of crabbing and lactation, completed enough of a workup to actually understand what the patient's care needs are. I think it's 
creates a pretext for them to be enabled um, when they don't want to have a difficult conversation with somebody else. Um, and so uh, I think that having having a protocol that directs them what to do is a, is a better way of handling things. Um, you're not always going to get the result of that you don't want to put your hand to get to the mutual consent of the other but I think that the, um, and, and the other part of this is that there will be a protocol process where the referral that appears to be out there would have to be done for people very kindly um, and by an impartial body and if they are basically giving out that referral on the basis of what information is going to be addressed by the hospital. Um, just to encapsulate, I, I actually am going to go on because our speaker time, I don't want to screw that up. Um, we, um, the collaborating agreements that, that, are, that are being formulated so far, they are between the hospital service and some of the specialties. We can use those if we choose to for our own interaction with who we, we share the clarification. They are not mandatory. So, you know, those of us who don't have those agreements, you know, that's our business to then um, make sure that the, the people we are calling for consultation, et cetera, are folks who understand what we expect of them. Anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead because I think the team that we have for our TME is very, very important. Um, and uh, Dr. Christian uh, Baker. Uh, and is uh, here to uh, give us uh, some enlightenment on sepsis. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. Good morning, everyone. I see familiar faces, um, people that uh, trained with me. Um, um, so we'll, we'll jump right in sepsis. There's a, a lot to talk about. I, I named the talk then and now because, unfortunately, as I'll go through in the talk, um, there's been therapies that had a lot of initial excitement, uh, which then was, was dampened um, uh, subsequently by more uh, data. So I, I don't have any disclosures to start out. Um, and the reason that we're, we're talking about this topic um, is because the condition is common, um, it's lethal, and it's expensive to the healthcare system. And you know, I could put a fourth point on there um, is that we, we tend to actually not do um, we as a you know collective um, medical system are not doing the best we could do to take care of it. And there's a lot of issues um, that I'll that I'll try to touch on. Um, so this is the uh, the agenda for this morning. Um, I'll just briefly uh, the talk has to include some uh, definitions, um, brief overview of epidemiology and pathophysiology, and then I'll, I'll spend some time um, going over why it's important to recognize um, sepsis. I won't show a lot of primary data, um, but rather an interpretation of the data. And then I'll, I'll do a, a timeline review of the evidence-based um, literature, and then briefly touch on the surviving sepsis campaign. Um, so to start out with, we, we know that sepsis is a continuum um, that goes from SERS to sepsis to severe sepsis and then septic shock and then maybe even has a, uh, uh, at the very end uh, a refractory septic shock. And uh, I think we're all aware of the criteria that, that uh, qualifies for systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Um, it's been criticized as exquisitely sensitive and exquisitely nonspecific, but that's exactly what it was designed to do, is to be very sensitive and not have anybody fall through the cracks. But then also it will inevitably uh, identify a lot of patients. Like I had a little bit of SIRS this morning when I walked up the steps. Um, and, and I'm not septic, I, I hope at least. Um, and then you know, if you have an infection, um, then you cross into sepsis, and then if you have any you know, simplified, if you have any organ dysfunction on top of that, then you cross over into severe sepsis, and then septic shock is if you need to use catecholamines to um, keep the physiology in check, and then you know refractory septic shock um, is is uh, an additional category. You know, one other purpose for these categories um, is that we all want to speak a unified language when we talk about the septic. 
um, continuum, and the other is that it will enable and it does enable studies to be consistent with the terminology. And the other important thing is that actually, I'll uh, just briefly mention the, the end organ dysfunction that makes you cross over from sepsis into severe sepsis can be anything on this list. It can be as simple as uh, an altered mental status, um, uh, changes in urine output, um, anything that's listed. Um, but what's also important is that actually, uh, and this has been shown nicely some time ago, um, that where you are on that spectrum directly corresponds to your mortality. So um, self-respecting service with you know two, three, or four criteria of that list roughly is 12.5% mortality. And then as you cross over into uh, sepsis that gets higher if you go into severe sepsis it's roughly 25% and then it doubles so it doubles per category and it's roughly 50% when you when you're in the septic shock category so it's important also from that perspective to know where on the sepsis continuum uh, we are um, this gets um, presented every time there is a talk about sepsis. It's a hugely important problem. Um, large numbers of cases and uh, very high costs to the healthcare system. In addition to this, I, I, I find it interesting to just compare um, both incidence and mortality uh, of sepsis with actually acute myocardial infarction. And it actually compares in both incidence and mortality to a first uh, acute myocardial infarction. So that illustrates that it's a, a, a widespread problem and very common. And it's not something that is rare and only happens uh, infrequently. Um, not every case of sepsis is due to an infection. Um, there's a large overlap with non-infectious uh, causes, burns, um, pancreatitis is in there that can um, be in here. Um, so, so this just serves to illustrate that uh, there's, there's lots of overlap. There's bacteremia that isn't going to cross into sepsis. Um, and so there's a distribution here. And so you can see that there's um, large overlaps. Um, as far as sources, um, this is a nice uh, study published in 2006 that, that tries to look at where the sources are, if it is uh, an infectious source. And not surprisingly, uh, the pulmonary system leads the way, followed by the abdomen and then GU skin um, follows along. Um, these are graphs from um, a landmark review article in the New England Journal of Medicine, just going over on the top left incidents um, in men and women, then going into different uh, ethnic uh, and racial backgrounds, then splitting it up by bacteria, and it looks like uh, gram-negative and gram-positive are, are way higher than fungi. But what I find important, and this is uh, dated by now, but uh, it's probably the best available data, is that in, in terms of mortality, we've not really been able to m make much progress. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that, um, well, actually, it would be interesting to see whether the last you know, five years have uh, made a dent uh, overall in the mortality here. Um, why is it important to recognize um, sepsis early? Um, that's a hugely important uh, question. And the, the issue has been that animal studies that looked at sepsis um, have shown success for a lot of therapies. And that was largely because um, in animals you can cause sepsis, like you know, puncture the, the cecum uh, and have leakage of bowel contents. And then the animal will become septic. And then what you do in animal studies is you intervene immediately after you did that. Um, but that's not the way that it usually works in humans. In humans, we have a delay from the onset of the septic uh, uh, episode and event. So that's essentially why there's been 20 or so studies that have failed to uh, replicate um, a benefit that was seen in animal studies in the human system. And that's probably because we're uh, having a lot more of a time delay. And it's a little bit that phenomenon that the horse is long out of the barn uh, when we get to the patient. Uh, and that's different than in animal studies. And that's probably because, and I just threw this up, this is a, 
uh, TNF alpha related signaling cascade is that a lot of things have long happened um, and, and it's a complicated system so we have to intervene here early because otherwise when there's clinical symptoms the damage is already done or a large proportion of the damage is already done. Um, but, so um, I want to first cover what is not really in that evidence-based um, category of studies because it just doesn't um, lend itself to uh, a study uh, with evidence-based uh, mechanisms because we can't have a control group that doesn't get antibiotics. Um, that would be pretty unfair. Um, so I want to make the point that adequate antibiotics and you know, which antibiotics and when to de-escalate, when to broaden, that's a, that's a lecture in and of itself, so I won't have time to you know, go into that. But I want to make the point that there's really, really numerous studies over and over again showing that adequate antibiotic therapy means early and it also means effective. And just as, a, as an illustration, I have a study here from 2006 that just looks at time from onset of hypotension on the x-axis to administration of antibiotics and then looks at the odds ratio of death. And it's really um, super impressive that there seems to be, you know, at least if not more than a linear relationship between how long it takes us to give antibiotics uh, with how likely it is that the patient actually will die to the point where it's you know almost certain if it's delayed for more than uh, 36 hours. Um, the other important point is that it doesn't just you know it's not just the early part of the equation but it also has to be adequate. There's been a nice study that's also dated by now um, that looked at adequate versus inadequate antibiotic coverage as, of course, you know, um, looked at in a, in a retrospective um, review and then looking at hospital mortality and seeing that it makes a huge uh, difference. So adequate means early and uh, effective. So that's, that's, um, that's pretty clear. And then the other aspect is that there is, uh, always has to be source control. So um, that's another added uh, level to this. Um, but then I, what I wanted to do uh, in the next 20 minutes or so is to just go over um, the review of the evidence-based literature. And that, that coincides with my um, professional uh, career um, of the last 15 years or so. Um, and and I'll, I'll put up a timeline in a minute. This is the alphabet soup of, of all the trials that are out there. Um, some of them we won't go into in more detail, but some of them I'll, I'll go over. But it's a nice um, story of actually um, the ups and downs of evidence bases and how we react to it as a, as a system, how we create algorithms and then we have to revisit them. And that's the case for the glucose control um, as well as for steroid support. Um, but I'll, I'll start out with a, with a timeline. So in 1999, there essentially was, was a part, obviously, from the antibiotic uh, literature, which was existing then already. There wasn't really anything out there. And then 2000 was, a, was a, an interesting year because that's when the um, lung protective ventilation ArtsNet trial was published, which didn't directly apply to sepsis, but most of our septic patients will be intubated and will need to be ventilated with a lung protective strategy. So I, I put this up here because um, there's a huge, huge overlap um, between um, ARDS and sepsis, obviously. And then 2001 was a very interesting year. Um, the first article looking at activated protein C um, for sepsis and then uh, intensive insulin therapy out of Belgium. Um, and then obviously the, one of the most cited studies, uh, the Rivers uh, study out of uh, Detroit, um, all were published in 2001, two of them actually in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, which was probably the most exciting um, time that an intensivist ever opened the uh, New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> um, so, Early goal-directed therapy is a, is a really important um, topic. I just wanted to point out some things that are really interesting about that study. It's, an, it's a single center um, a study. It's Henry Ford Hospital in, in Detroit. Um, and it was only 130 patients in each arm, um, 263 patients uh, altogether. And it compared standard therapy for septic shock with 
uh, early goal directed therapy, and that was the, the golden six hours uh, of care. And it was actually done not in the intensive care unit, uh, it was done in the emergency department. So there was a specific area designated with specific study nurses and study physicians. And so if you were randomized to that arm, you just got um, taken care of in the uh, emergency department. And this was the algorithm that was used. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It just uh, consisted of very aggressive measures um, up front, um, catheter, central venous catheter placement with CVP measurements, and then uh, fluid resuscitation. Um, invasive uh, arterial pressure monitoring, um, central venous um, O2 set monitoring, which was actually in this study done with a specific catheter from Edwards Life Sciences that was able to measure this um, as a continuous variable. And then there were also, also things that um, I actually debated uh, as far as the overall usefulness, which was uh, a very aggressive transfusion of red blood cells, and then additional you know, inotropic agents. And then you just ran through this algorithm very aggressively. And if you were not randomized to that, then you just got the, the standard um, of care, uh, which certainly wasn't an algorithmic approach like this. Um, very, very impressive mortality reduction, the standard therapy. And this also shows that these patients, inner city, um, population were incredibly sick. So for the standard therapy, there was a mortality um, that's, that's up there with what's quoted from before, but, but uh, this is about as high as, as a study population uh, with mortality ever gets. And then the uh, early goal directed therapy, a uh, very impressive reduction. So the number needed to treat uh, to save one life uh, one month out is only six, which is very impressive. Um, but overall, um, very impressive that a single center study with only 260 patients um, was able to show this and that it made it into the New England Journal of Medicine. There's not that many you know, single center studies with 260 patients that make it into the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, next topic is a slightly more uh, confusing overall in the timeline. It's, it's, it's a little bit unclear which way to go, but it started out really clear. Um, which was the study um, with uh, uh, Gerd van den Brecher from, uh, from Belgium, also a single center study. It was a um, post-cardiac surgery ICU, so important to, to be aware of the population that we're talking about here, published in 2001. And it basically uh, compared intensive insulin therapy uh, in critical illness uh, with a goal of 80 to 110 with conventional therapy, which tolerated a lot higher values. And what they showed is that the mortality uh, between these groups um, was reduced with intensive insulin therapy. A lot of you know, discussion about what mechanisms it is. Is, is it direct um, glucose effects of uh, of insulin therapy, or there's, there's also other effects that are independent of the of the glucose itself that may have conveyed a, a, a benefit. So that's when essentially all all intensive care units in the country started uh, writing up protocols for intensive insulin therapy, and and and, and those who who practice probably you know were, were part of that, um, and we were trying to get the sugars down really low, and then don't don't get them too low because then you have you know, hypoglycemic events and that, that'll come up as a theme a little bit later. Um, so that was the, the, the status in 2002, which was uh, um, only complemented by um, a study that was published a year later and that looked at um, cortisone, hydrocortisone um, replacement for patients in septic shock, and that's also you know, a controversial topic with the evidence base that we have now. But essentially, and, and all talks have to have a, you know, a classical um, uh, painting in them to, as, as a reference, so I, I have mine here. Um, so on the left is, is Circe offering the, the cup to uh, Odysseus, uh, and then this is uh, Jalali Anani, um, and he's uh, um, a, a French researcher who published on critical illness related critical steroid insufficiency, CIRC, um, and his study uh, was published in JAMA in, in 2002, looking at 300 patients with septic shock, and then basically uh, did an ACTH stimulation test and 
um, and then randomized um, to either hydrocortisone and fluidocortisone or um, a placebo and then looked at 20, 28 day survival. And, and their findings were, were really uh, impressive as well. Um, if you didn't respond to the ACTH simulation test, then you had a reduction in mortality if you received low dose steroids. But if you did respond, then the picture was pretty much reversed. And so that then in 2002 led to everybody getting ACTH stimulation tests and then being you know, given hydrocortisone um, if they had septic shock. Um, so in 2002, then that was the the height of the of the evidence based. We had a we had a go uh, with all these um, therapies. So early day directed therapy, lung protective ventilation, um, activated protein C, intensive insulin, and then corticosteroids. And since then, the evidence has um, eroded a little bit uh, for for some of the topics. Um, I won't go since uh, Zygos activated protein C was withdrawn from the market. We're not going to spend any time, you know, going into details. Um, but there were two studies that actually put a dent into the initial excitement uh, of the Prowess trial, and they were published in 2005. And then in 2006, there was actually the, the antici long anticipated follow-up study. Um, the intensive insulin uh, therapy study was done in a post-cardiac surgery population, so immediately all medical intensivists uh, were asking, well, what about my patient population? I don't, I don't necessarily take care of post-surgical. Does this apply to medical populations as well? So in, in 2006, the very same group uh, out of Belgium actually looked at, at that population and did essentially the same thing that they did before, and they published this in 2006. Um, there were slight differences in the study design. This didn't really utilize um, dedicated study nurses, but this was sort of folded into the routine practice. But essentially, you know, the only difference is um, that it, it had uh, m more patients and it was uh, the medical intensive care unit, but, but the same targets um, and then comparing intensive uh, versus uh, not so intensive conventional insulin therapy. And what you can see is that um, now the overall hospital mortality didn't differ. Um, but if you stayed in the ICU for longer than three days, and this was a subgroup analysis, then there was a mortality reduction. So the, the issue, obviously, with that is that that wasn't the primary outcome, and that was a, you know, a sub-analysis, and it's difficult to to know beforehand who would be in your ICU for longer than three days. So that put a big damper uh, on the intensive insulin therapy. Um, and then in 2008, um, a follow-up study, Corticus, was, was published on the topic of um, hydrocortisone and steroid um, um, support for septic shock. Um, and that, just to keep with the same color scheme of the other, um, actually didn't replicate the findings at all, which was very surprising. So this was a multi-center study, just like the other um, study in, in JAMA. So that led to a, a big discussion as to why it was that these uh, studies found different results. Um, and what I just, for illustration purposes, wanted, wanted to briefly do is, is contrast um, the two studies. Um, so Patient population, medical, a little more surgical in the in the cortico study. Um, you know, multicenter. Um, this was exclusively France. This was Europe. Um, the enrollment window in in Corticus was a lot longer. And then also there were differences in that um, fluid cortisone and mineral corticoid wasn't used in the cortico study. Um, and the other difference was that. Uh, the first study actually abruptly stopped the steroids um, if there was hemodynamic stability, and the corticus actually tapered them down gradually. But a striking difference in the in the mortality, 63% um, um, versus 36%. Um, so this population was uh, incredibly sick, even sicker than the Detroit um, uh, group. So. Um, there's also differences in the in the in the shock um, reversal and, and some other questions of study design. So, how do we put that together um, with with what we should do uh, with steroid replacement? Maybe um, patients that are extremely sick uh, benefit more from corticosteroids than patients that have a lower 
uh, overall lower mortality. But I think if you look at academic institutions uh, across the country, I don't think there is a unified, um, clear approach as to how, how you reconcile these these data. Um, what we do at Sinai is we, we usually um, think about corticosteroid um, as as a treatment modality, if we have mid to high range of catecholamines that we need to use to to keep the physiology going, we don't usually use it with low doses. The other interesting aspect is that there was a, a huge criticism of the Anani study because uh, and and that really even crossed over into questions of ethical misconduct or um, or scientific well dare I say fraud, um, and that was that there was. Uh, an admixture of um, disproportionate admixture of patients who were induced with automidate for their intubation uh, in the uh, treatment group. So, you know, skeptics and cynical uh, comments were that actually what this study proved is that automidate does suppress the um, the adrenal axis, and if you use it, then you have to have a lower threshold of actually. Um, depleting corticosteroids because you have a higher uh, risk of relative adrenal insufficiency, even with a single dose of, you know, of atomidate. That's that's a, a side effect or a complication that's known for this drug. And and given that there was a disproportionate admixture, you know, you could say that certainly, um, if there is that drug um, used for the intubation, then I think that's something that that lower, should lower the threshold of of giving corticosteroid support. Um, and these are the, the synthesized uh, recommendations from uh, uh, critical care of medicine is that SUSI is best diagnosed by a doctor, but it does not help to identify which patients actually um, should get steroids. A um, little bit controversial um, is the recommendation um, to actually give IV hydrocortisone as a continuous infusion. Um, we at Sinai don't do that because it's yet another perfusion pump as opposed to giving it you know, every six hours, um, and the data is not that clear. Um, and patients should be treated uh, for seven days before tapering, and it shouldn't be uh, stopped abruptly. Um, and the other thing is that you know the fluidal cortisone did that play a role that was addressed actually by yet another study that I'll briefly mention. Um, so in the end, it's it's not as clear of a of a of an evidence based situation for the corticosteroids. Um, so now we're in 2009, and then yet yet another um, damper on the intensive insulin therapy, the the nice sugar trial um, that actually looked at a very, very nice uh, large number of patients, international, multicenter, and their target was even more aggressive, um, 82, 108, uh, and that's just because of differences of the units um, used in, in this study. Um, and then seeing that actually intensive glucose control in this study with a large patient population increased um, mortality. And that was probably because of the issue that, that um, we touched on earlier is that, that obviously whenever you do tight glucose control, you run the risk of hypoglycemic events, which may have an adverse um, you know, event, uh, um, may be unfavorable. Um, and that obviously also depends on specifically how much nursing support do you have to carry this out. Obviously, if you have a, a dedicated study nurse with the patient at all times, your risk of hypoglycemia is way lower, which was more of a scenario that we had with the, uh, the first study that was published in 2001. And then these studies were actually really more a real-world scenario where it was factored into the study design that you actually have to do this in the real world and you don't have study nurses to, to carry this up, you have to, to um, you know, do this in the, in the context of what, how you function on a regular basis. Um, like I said, uh, there's a follow-up study um, that basically did a, a criticized a factorial 2 by 2 design to look at the question of whether fluidal cortisone played a role. Um, and it actually found that, that it, it didn't seem to convey this, this benefit of um, steroid replacements. And then yet another damper uh, on the uh, Zygris um, story um, published in 2012 and then in 2013 
um, the, the drug was withdrawn from the market. Um, and so where, where does that leave us in, in, in 2014? Just over that 15-year um, time span, um, it seems like what has held up um, nicely is early goal-directed therapy. Um, the interesting, and, and that's actually something that I think is being worked on, is to update this algorithm um, that was used, that, that used uh, central venous pressure um, and, and pulse oximetry or oxygen saturation to the 2014 scenario, and probably ultrasound would play a lot more of a role. Um, echocardiography, um, you know, non-invasive measuring of uh, cardiac output might you know, have a place in this algorithm. And then the other thing that nicely held up is the lung protective ventilation that hasn't been um, challenged in a major way. Um, so it, it, it's, it's overall the story of you know, the, the, the focus being on the early goal-directed therapy and the early recognition, resuscitation, obviously antibiotics, and then to, to do lung protective ventilation. And the, so, so that certainly absolutely holds up. Um, the early goal-directed therapy um, is still very important, the lung protective ventilation, and then you have to be, you know, a little more um, cautious about corticosteroids um, for fluid non-responsive shock. Um, Zygris is out. Um, An intensive insulin therapy maybe shouldn't be that uh, intensive, but there probably should be some form of, um, of modest control of, of glucose. Um, just switching gears for, for, the, for the last um, um, thing I want to touch on is, is actually that um, this is a study um, that was published uh, by a German uh, a group, and the quote is, um, it, it's not enough to, to know, um, you have to do, uh, to, and this is essentially just very, very um, simple. It asked intensivists whether they are, whether they thought they were compliant uh, for any given patient on no tidal volume ventilation, glycemic control, uh, and then measurements of, of um, uh, fluid resuscitation. Um, and then steroids, and it, it shows that um, you know, the intensivists said that they did all these things, but then when you really looked at whether they were compliant, um, and I think that's something that I'm probably guilty of on a, on a frequent basis, where I think I'm, I'm doing my lung protective ventilation, but then there may be a parameter that isn't really fully uh, under control. So that just you know, serves to to um, to reinforce that it's important to always be critical and make sure that we're really doing the things that we think we're doing. Um, which brings me to the Surviving Sepsis uh, campaign. And, and you may be um, familiar with the, the structure. It was initiated in 2004. And at that point, it was funded by industry with a very uh, heavy investment by Eli Lilly, the maker of activated protein C. Um, Zygris, and it was a, a Delphi consensus um, mechanism to come up with recommendations. It was heavily criticized for the involvement in industry um, because the motivations were, were clear is, is to really uh, get out Zygris and, and push that, that drug. And, and the follow-up um, iterations of the surviving sepsis campaign actually don't have any direct industry funding anymore, and it's still a modified uh, consensus. Um, and it's, it's interesting reading for, for those who are not familiar but interested, there's, there's been obviously a huge debate about the, the structure and the industry involvement of, uh, of Eli and Lily in, in this uh, expert consensus uh, mechanism. Um, but what I think is interesting and what's emphasized more and more is that um, the committee, and this was true in 2008 and for the 2012 as well, is that currently the greatest outcome improvement can be made through education and process change for those caring for severe sepsis patients in, in the non-ICU setting and across the spectrum of acute care. So that means, you know, we're talking about before you even get to the ICU. And also, you know, an interesting um, population is those patients that actually make it out of the ICU and then obviously at risk for recurrent septic events and those 
you know, we, we, we deem the, uh, to be the chronically critically ill. So that's, that's a, a very specific population as well. But it looks like um, the campaign is really shifting the focus to um, before um, the ICU. And I just um, listed, and it's not important what the, the, the treatments are in detail, but I just listed what are the recommendations fall within the medical ward uh, and what are really more ICU heavy um, from, from top to bottom. And it looks like um, this first set of uh, recommendations um, really needs to apply to the pre-ICU setting. So early goal directed therapy, antibiotics, any source control issues need to be addressed, um, and then more, more detailed uh, recommendations. But essentially, our early goal directed therapy, antibiotics, and source control seem like they uh, give you the, the biggest buck if they actually happen before patients make it to the ICU. Obviously, it's very important to to be aware of what, what specific uh, model you're operating under. Is it really, really easy to get your patients to the ICU really quickly? If that's the setting, then it's obviously less important. Um, you know, we at Sinai and, and Jessica knows this from, from experience. Oftentimes, there's a, a, a long delay um, to, to even get our patients to the ICU. So essentially, the ICU care needs to be initiated in, in all of its um, modalities before patients even make it to the ICU. Um, but it seems like that's that's more and more um, the focus. But overall, just to, to, to wrap up, um, any recognition even before the ICU is of prime importance in an early aggressive marker directed fluid, fluid resuscitation and hemodynamic management, ideally with variables that can be obtained on a continuous basis. So it's not really, you know, if the turnaround time for your lactic acid measurements is, you know, an hour, then that's maybe not the best marker because that hour is essentially lost. Um, if it's a quick bedside test and there's these, you know, portable units coming out now that actually allow bedside lactic acid measurements or continuous variables, uh, ultrasonography, um, are very, very important. Um, and then timely and appropriate antibiotic therapy and timely source control uh, measures. So it's sort of humbling how, how we really got back to the, to the basics and how the more um, differentiated therapies actually seem to have a role, but not as clear and not as important um, as what I have up here. So um, I'll, I'll close by saying that South is that way. Um, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with earlier when you said that the tried and true uh, therapy early in the bed or early resuscitation. And your institution, in terms of the best way to resuscitate, you mentioned, sort of touched on ultrasound and some of the other dynamic parameters. What do you guys find? The most helpful is it the bedside ultrasound or some of the technique measurement dynamic variables? Yeah, so, so um, I, I should um, mention that we actually um, created a um, medical acute response service or a critical care consultation service um, probably about nine years ago. Um, and and then we added on another layer, which was a, a sepsis nurse practitioner driven service that actually goes over and monitors um, the source criteria on all medical inpatients. And there's a best practice alert that, that will pop up and that will alert the nurse practitioner on the sepsis team um, that there might be a patient with early signs of sepsis. And that then will trigger a, an evaluation. Uh, and obviously, we have a lot of false positives for that. And, and that's built into the system, and everybody is aware of that. But then the, the true positives that we pick up then will bumped up to the, to the medical acute response team. And so then that team will go out, um, which then allows you to have the tools that you want. And, and we find uh, very, very useful um, uh, ultrasound um, measures, IVC collapsibility for, for early resuscitation. Um, the stroke volume variation, like in the, in the pre-ICU setting, is a little bit um, 
more complicated. Um, but lactic acid measurements, and we're actually right now looking into, um, in, in study settings, we have used this lactic acid um, tool. It's, it's the same uh, look, the same device as your glucometers. Um, so bedside measurements of, of lactic acidosis as a, as a means of response, you know, clearance of lactic acidosis, uh, and then you know, quick bedside ultrasound um, as sort of nice, timely variables um, to make early resuscitation um, decisions. But then also really the, the team that's there so that, that there's not a hesitancy by you know, um, other providers who are not as familiar with with sepsis to you know be non-aggressive with fluids because of concerns of you know of pulmonary edema or issues that really are not the concerns of the of the sepsis team is to to, to not lose those golden six hours. Um, so anything that's more con more continuous variable um, is more useful. Obviously, in that early phase, we don't always have central venous um, catheters in place, so that becomes less of a useful you know tool. Obviously, once you go into the into the uh, later hours, then that's more of a more of a. We don't find uh, central venous pressure useful unless it's really unless it's really really low. Um, that's a useful number, but you know, but if it's really high, it's not that useful. But I think it's it's really the non-invasive, um, timely, continuous variables that are useful. Right. No, this is this is a system that actually um, um, pops up for the nurse, and then the nurse reviews and goes through a checklist. Uh, and then the nurse actually. Yeah. 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 So you know, however, whatever the detailed uh, details are of how you set this up, but but you you want to not miss things, so you you have to build in that it will be showing you a lot of false positives. Um, and then it has to go through, and we found it useful to actually have different levels of. Of involvement, so the nurse practitioners will deal with, uh, you know, the more routine um, situations. And if it really looks like um, we're picking up a, a true positive, where aggressive uh, early management is important, then we'll kick it up all the way to the the full um, critical care consult team, which consists of a, of a critical care attending, a critical care fellow, um, and that yeah, and then the nurse practitioner is involved too. Um, so there's different layers to the system because otherwise, and outside of care, yeah, all, all, all yeah. You know, so this 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 uh, was just actually expanded to all um, floors in the in the hospital. So um, we piloted it uh, on certain floors, and then now it's it's um, and it obviously it, it's a, it's a complex system because it, it only works when you have buy-in from the nurses and when you have buy-in from other providers because otherwise you have antagonistic, you know, I don't want my patient to receive. I don't want my patient to, to you know get antibiotics or not those antibiotics. So you have to sort of work as a as a as a team on that. And the nurses have to be educated um, and we, so we frequently meet and, and discuss um, you know developments and and, uh, and it's still a work in progress. So there's still things that I think um, but it, it seems to be working um, very well. It looks like we have a, a reduction in mortality from, from sepsis. So you have to be you know, see that that's really sustained over time, but um, it makes sense that if you pick up if you pick up these patients earlier, I mean, in the ideal world, right, you would have doctors, uh, nurses um, on on a one geographic floor being aware of all these changes. You wouldn't have any handoffs. You wouldn't have any ch changes in teams. But then people don't sleep, and then you have other issues. But then you know you wouldn't maybe need all these electronic things to to tell you that there is a problem. But if you have you know the system of care that we have, then these these um, safeguards uh, seem to be more important. Um, do you have the surveillance in the ED, and do you also respond to like a code sepsis in the ED? Um, that's yeah, very good question. That's a, that's sort of a, a separate uh, jurisdiction. They have a similar system in in our emergency department that works in in similar ways, but is is functioning within the you know teams of the of the um, of the ED, but uh, as far as I'm aware, there, there actually there will also be these best practice alerts, and then that will also trigger uh, an alarm, and then there's a specific uh, 
team assigned to these patients, and then these patients will be moved into recess, into a resuscitation area from where they were before, and then this essentially like a you know the early goal directed therapy scenario of the river study will sort of kick in in the ED as well. Any other uh, questions for uh, uh, speaker this morning? Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Just a process question. If you're um, floors, somebody yeah. going in uh, into uh, sepsis after admission to a medical care. Now, you have dedicated teams for that too, or you have that one team headed by nurse practitioners who are responding to you? Um, that would be, yeah, it would be going through that. Now, obviously, the, the uh, medical team independent.